Okay. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> my name's Diane Camacho, and I am a consultant for solo and small law firms uh, across the country, basically for helping partners relieve some of the stress and relieve some of the tasks that they're doing that are non-billable. So helping you organize and coordinate your office and get things moving so that you can practice law and not manage minutia and you can be looking for clients. The other thing we do is we help attorneys start up law firms. So we work on a lot of different levels. I've worked with attorneys for about 35 years. Been um, I started this company in 2013. So those of us that work here have all been managing law firms for a very long time. Early on, I found that many of our clients did not manage their trust accounts properly. So I've been giving a trust account seminar for probably four or five years in various locations for various different bar associations and attorney groups. This year, as we all know, California State Bar has put something new in place. I want you to understand that it does not change any of the rules and regulations regarding how you manage your trust funds. So if you're doing everything and everything's fine, all you need to do now is tell the state bar, I know what I'm doing and I'm doing it. So that's kind of the, the change. It's not the rules. It is how the state bar is trying to monitor whether attorneys are managing their trust accounts. So <clears throat> trust accounts are one of the top reasons that attorneys get reported to the bar, disbarred, and that is across the country. We find this in Massachusetts, in Florida, in Texas, in Denver, we find it all over the, the United States. So it's not a California issue. It's one of those things that attorneys don't learn unless they go and proactively look for the information. So it's oftentimes something that kind of sneaks up on an attorney. It's not usually a malicious incident, although obviously there are situations like that. We always have to remember that this is not the firm's money. That's the first premise. This is not our money. This is somebody else's money that we have a fiduciary responsibility of managing. It's not the firm's interest. If you have an interest bearing account and you should, it should be going to the state bar. And we need to document all of this information. We need to be able to report to our clients, report to the state bar, report to each other what's going on in our state bar trust account. And we need to make sure that we're reconciling it and we're reconciling it appropriately and properly. So we'll talk about all of these different things. So the rules, regulations are the uh, 1.15 safekeeping property from the American Bar Association. And pretty much every state that I've looked at the state bar guidelines has a similar clause in their state bar rules of professional conduct. So, so everybody in the United States is, is adhering to these rules. And then we have the California rules of professional conduct, which is 4-100, which is preserving the identity of funds and property for clients. So those are the two overriding rules, regulations, laws, however you wanna look at it. Those, that's where you're getting guidance for these. <clears throat> so if we talk about the interest, we all talk about trust accounts and we often say IOLTA accounts and IOLTA accounts are accounts that are set up that are owned by the state bar that you're operating in and the interest automatically goes to the state bar. So when you're setting up your bank accounts for your law firm, you want to make sure that you're working with a bank that understands that process and understands that the fees for that account should come out of your operating account, the tax ID for your account is actually the state bars and all the interest goes to the state bar. Now, of course, if you have a very large check and you wanna open up an account for that particular client, perhaps it's the, the proceeds from the sale of a house and you haven't distributed it yet because the trust hasn't been formalized, you can put that in a client trust account for that client and that client can receive the interest. So that's kind of a little bit different than what we're talking about. Now we're talking about the, the trust account that most of us have, that is our client's 
money is commingled in our account. So this is what has been rolled out in California in 2023, the Client Trust Account Protection Program. So the rules are the same. And one of the handouts is actually the hand, handout, the handbook on trust accounting for California. And the difference is we now are responsible for certifying that we understand how to monitor and how to handle client trust funds. And we give the state bar the balance of our trust account at the end of the calendar year. So right now we're required to tell the state bar through the interface that we all send our, we all pay our bar dues. So there's a, a law firm portal. We go in there, we pay our dues. We might pay the dues for five or six attorneys. And in there, there's a place now that allows you to put in the balance of your trust account on December 31st, 2022. And that's going to be a requirement annually from now on. The firm can certify the balance in your trust account on behalf of all the attorneys in the office. However, now the attorneys need to complete a self-assessment or self-evaluation on their my state bar account. And again, one of the handouts gives you some information about this. And it's basically going to say, do you understand everything that I'm going to talk about today? And is your firm adhering to these policies or practices? You can certainly speak to the person that is in accounting or your managing partner and talk to them, talk to them and, and ask them if they are following these procedures. And them saying that they are is okay, you don't have to go in there and do your own personal audit. You just have to be responsible for working with clients that you have money for responsibly. And you may not be the originating attorney, you may not be the responsible attorney, it doesn't matter. You just have to do it. So attorneys that don't directly work with the trust funds are called subordinate attorneys. And it says here, a subordinate lawyer may consult a supervisory lawyer to confirm that the duties that are not personally performed are being properly discharged by others in the firm. So you go and you talk to them. You obviously know what you're talking about. They obviously say yes. A lot of times these things that we're supposed to do are being handled by our practice management software. <clears throat> so it's happening kind of automatically. The only attorneys that are not responsible for doing this are attorneys that are not on active status or are not entitled to practice law. Those of them attorneys that have been disbarred because they've been mishandling their trust accounts don't have to certify anything. So it's basically every attorney in the state of California. And it may seem ridiculous, but it's the only way that we can assure that this information is really given to everybody that is responsible for trust funds at some point. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the trust account and, and what's going on in the trust account. <clears throat> so it's an interest on trust accounts and it is what I talked about. The interest is sent to the state bar. It's the state bar's tax ID number. If the firm is operating in multiple states, not that if say it's not does that doesn't mean that I have an attorney in Denver. I have to open up a Denver trust account. If you have an office in Denver, you should have an opera, uh, trust account in Denver, and you should be paying those fees to Denver. If it's one case, a couple of one offs, that's you know you 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 you'll be okay to kind of keep it in California. But at some point, you are you're registering that you're doing business in the state of Colorado as an attorney, and you will be responsible for giving them the interest on your trust account. So I can't tell you how much money or how many clients or whatever, but if you have an office in multiple states, you should have a trust account in the individual states. We talked about the one client, you can hold a large amount of money, and that can be just what your firm states is their policy. I worked for a firm many, many years ago, and any client that we had more than $15,000 for in trust we would open up a trust account and that person would retain their interest. That was when there was actually interest interest on our savings accounts, right? 
that's not as important now since we're not getting much interest. So the law firm's duty, the law firm's duty is to make sure that the firm, that the funds are separate from firm funds. They aren't commingled into a oper an operating account. Find the right bank. There are banks on the state bar website that are authorized to create and hold trust funds. It's most banks in California. If you have a bank that's not on there, you probably can get them put on there, but it's most of the banks that we're using. I highly recommend that you use a business bank just from a, a professional standpoint that has a business banker that can support you personally and can support the firm. And they, when you walk in and you say, okay, I need a I need a client trust account for this person and I need one for my firm. They know what you're talking about and they know what an IALTA account is. They know how to set it up. They know that they have to send the information to the state bar. If you walk into a bank and they don't understand this, I really encourage you not to educate them to find a bank that knows this. <clears throat> I had a client who decided that they wanted to use an on -bank, online bank for their trust account. And obviously the online bank had no idea what they were doing. The interest was going back to the client for several years and there was no physical brick and mortar bank in the state that they were operating in. So that's what I, one of the other requirements, it, it needs to be a bank, it, it, this online stuff, the, you know, you can't do it through VRBO. You know, it, it needs to be a bank and it needs to have an office, uh, office somewhere in your state, even though we're doing a lot of things electronically, it needs to have a brick and mortar office. You have to report on client ledger cards, and I'll give you an example uh, later in the session, exactly what happens, what money goes in and what money goes out individually with specific information for that client. You have to keep your records for five years after the disbursement of the money, which should be the end of the case or the end of the case. Now, which means basically you want to keep your trust information indefinitely. You're not going to pull out information about a specific client and say, okay, I'm going to destroy that, that client trust account information, but keep everybody else's. It's just easier to keep it all electronically. And then your monthly reconciliation needs to happen. And that's reconciling your bank, your, if you have QuickBooks or something like that, QuickBooks, and then also your time and billing software. You should notify your client when you get money on their behalf. Normally, now they're getting a receipt. Either you're handing them a receipt because they're giving you a check in your office or a credit card receipt in your office, or they are getting a receipt from your payment processing software. So they're getting a receipt from law pay or something like that. That is also a receipt that they can have, that you can keep for the, uh, to satisfy this. What goes into the IOLTA account? Retainers, settlement checks, cost advances, any money that the firm has not earned and build goes into an IALTA account. Any settlement checks, even if you have money that is owed to you on that settlement check. So you have a settlement check, you get a third of it, somebody else gets a third of it, somebody else gets a third of it. It doesn't go into your operating account to write checks out of. It goes into your trust account. Those checks need to come from your trust account. And you need to make a transfer or write a check to yourself from your trust account. You also need to get that money out of your trust account quickly. It can't stay there as a savings account. That's commingling funds. That money is your client's money. It's not your money. Don't commingle it either in the trust account or in your operating account. Cost advances can go in. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got that cold thing going on, so I'm coughing a little bit. Cost advances can go in there. That doesn't mean that Every time you get a check, or every time you get a bill on behalf of your client, you write a check or transfer the money into your operating account to write the check for the messenger service or for, you know, whatever. It means that if you have an agreement with the client in the engagement letter that says that they're going to prepay their costs, that goes into the trust fund. 
If you say, okay, we're having depots next week and I need $5,000 to cover the expenses and they give you a check, that can go into the trust account. Those checks should be written out of the trust account. If you're issuing a whole bunch of checks and it's a lot of activity and a, a lot of small items, then I suggest you put it into the trust account, put it into the operating account and write those checks out of operating. But it's, if it's substantial money, substantial amounts, they can come out of the trust account. When does it come out? When it's ordered by a judge? When it's earned by the law firm? Or when the new firm is retained? Or at the end of the case? That's it. So we all understand when it's ordered by a judge, we get an order and they say distribute the funds based on this and this and this. <laughs> earned by the law firm does not mean you worked for that client. It means you worked and you billed that client. So if you have a practice that is largely retainer-based, and you're working on cash flow and you just want to make sure that you have you know, money in the middle of the month for payroll, you can certainly do your billing twice a month. But you can't say on the 15th, okay, payroll's due on the 17th. Let's see how many hours I worked on Diane's case and transfer money from the trust account to operating. Can't do that. You have to issue a bill that day, give it to the client and, re and pull the money out of trust. The client technically has to have an opportunity to dispute those fees. If they don't ever see the bill, they don't ever see the fees. If you're doing that regularly, you can run into some, some issues just with managing. So if you're doing that, I recommend that you only bill each client once a month and you have some of them that you bill half you know, on the, on the 15th and some of them that you in the bill on the third or so, the, the first or something like that. So that you, you split up your client base and you bill twice a month if you need that for cash flow. But the bills have to go out. Technically, they have to go out. The client has to have an opportunity to reply and say, I dispute $1,500 of this. And then you can disperse the money to pay yourself the rest of the bill. Nowadays, we have these wonderful practice management software that says, hey, do you want to apply your trust balance to this bill before you send it out? We all do it, most of us do it. I, When I'm counseling clients, I recommend they don't do that. I recommend they send their bills out on the fifth and then they wait 10 days and make their trust transfer into their operating just to give yourself that, we let, uh, give yourself that um, time for, an attorney, for a client to come back and, and dispute something. <clears throat> if you are taking money out of the trust account as you are issuing the bill, make sure it states that in your engagement agreement. The engagement agreement, we'll talk a little bit about this, needs to state exactly what you're going to do with that client's money. Obviously, when a new firm is retained, then you need to reconcile that bank account, account reconcile that trust account. The client should get a, a ledger. I'll show you one of those again. And the new client, uh, the new um, law firm would get a, a check from the trust account to them. Obviously, at the end of the case, they should get their money reimbursed to them. <clears throat> now, some firms keep trust money until the end of the case and then give all the trust money back. Some people use it to pay bills. <laughs> but this is also where we don't follow up on that. It's not part of our normal process, our normal billing process. Okay, so we had these five cases close this week. What do we have in trust? Or we have, you know, it's the end of the year. Okay, let's look at the cases that closed this year. Let's get all those checks out. Maybe it happens in January because that's a slow month. Maybe it's part of your billing process so that every month when you're doing trust transfers, your billing person will also look for cases that are closed and send those checks back to the clients. You wanna have this be clean and neat because you can get audited and they will look at everything. We talked a little bit about this and this is where people really get into trouble. They're borrowing, oh, it's you know two days to, payroll, I need to make my lease payment, whatever. I'm just going to grab a few hundred dollars from trust to cover it and I'll put it back. If you get audited, that is going to be very, 
it's going to be look, it's going to be frowned upon very harshly. This isn't a line of credit. Commingling, we talked about that. You don't want to mix your money with the client's money. You want to make sure that you get that switched quickly. I have clients who have, well, it's just easier for the client if they only have one link. So we always have them send their trust deposits to our operating account. And then once a month, if we remember, we move that money into trust. Create two links. You have a trust account. You have an operating account. Send out the right link with the right request. If it's a trust account request, it goes out, it goes into your trust account. The clients will understand that. And if it's an honest mistake, it's an honest mistake. Don't operate your firm as if everything's going to go wrong all the time. So you do it in a way that's fearful. Trust account money should not be wired or um, deposited in your operating account. <laughs> and then moved into your trust account. That's comm commingling. <clears throat> Paying expenses with trust accounts. We talked a little bit about this where we um, talked about the, you know, managing managing your cash flow basically through using your trust account to pay expenses. Don't do that. You, you want this to be clean and neat and very clear. If you get audited or a client asks you a question, you don't want to have a bunch of 17 different withdrawals and deposits in the same month. You want to make sure that you have, you have really clear, clean records. And then if you have, if you, like we talked about, if you have large amounts, write the check, either the trust check directly to the, to the um, vendor or move that amount from the trust to the operating account and write that check so that it's really clear what you're doing with that money. There's no ambiguity. There's a question, how many days must you provide client before paying yourself? Is there going to be random audits? Can you pay client costs out of operating and then bill the client? Okay, so number one is, it's a law term, a, re a reasonable amount of time, time enough to give the client an opportunity to dispute the bill. I say 10 days. I say if you're mailing them, you know, they're going to get them in two or three days. If you're sending them electronically, they're going to get them that day. Most likely they're going to open their attorney bills and look at those. I say 10 days. That's what we ask our clients to use as the, by the from the time the bill is sent to the time that you pulled the uh, the uh, trust. That doesn't mean that from the time that the billing department printed the bills and they went to reception and sat there for three days before they got mailed out. So just make sure that your that your process is, is good and clean. I don't know if they're gonna do random audits. I would be surprised if they're gonna do random audits because I don't think they're staffed for it unless somebody on this call feels differently. That's my personal opinion. And you can absolutely pay your client costs out of operating and then bill for it. Okay, so we're going to talk about reporting, and this is one of the ways that law firms get into a little bit of trouble. One of the reasons they do is because they have software that doesn't create these reports for them. And <clears throat> that's, all, that's all I can say. I, I don't know. They don't know that they're supposed to keep them, and then the, the software programs don't actually keep you know keep records like this that you can print out and then if a client asks for it you have somebody going through all the records auditing it reconciling it and then doing an excel spreadsheet and sending it out they should be able to call at any time and get their ledger their trust ledger it's called a ledger it's a report it used you know it comes from the ledger cards that people used to fill out or the ledger books. They should be able to get that. It should be reconciled every month. Also, the firm should be able to print out a report that has all the activity in that trust account for every client for the firm that month. So let's look at a couple of those reports. 
this is a very simplistic firm trust account ledger. So as you can see, it's for the month of May. We've got the clients and the matters. We've got the previous month balance, the activity, the activity date, and current balance. This is really, re really important. For some reason, one of the requirements is that there's a report with a running balance. And that's what this is. You can look at it at any time and see that it's the actual balance in that client trust for that person. And if you're doing this, like I said, within your practice management software, it will automatically generate one of these reports if you ask for it. So you're going to put in there how much they were in the how much they had at the beginning of the month, the activity, when it was, and exactly what it paid, what you did. You know, they replenished, you got replenishment, and you've got the $905. Same thing. You can just walk through this report and see what you have. This amount of money, this $3,155, should balance with your bank. This is often what is not being balanced, what is not being reconciled which is very, very expensive when you have to have somebody like my firm come in and reconcile your bank accounts to your client billing back to like say 2010, 2015, which we recently did for a client. Very expensive, but it needs to be done. And you need to go back and balance to the penny <clears throat> as much as possible. In some instances, you might tra change trust accounts. So you might say, you might move from B of A to Wells Fargo, for example, and you didn't reconcile your B of A account. And it doesn't match your client billing software for the end of that year. You're never going to recruit that money. You need to talk to um, your CPA or somebody like that to, to figure out how you want to correct that. But it needs to be corrected. And you need to get to a point where you're balanced to the penny and you can move forward. It should be done at the beginning, at the end of the year. And right now it's important, obviously, because who knows what they're going to do. So that's the firm trust account ledger. And then each client, you can do this either by client or by client matter, but I've got this by client. I'm the client. This is my trust account. I've got client one, uh, matter one is 57, matter two is 75. They're all commingled, but you can see funds in, funds out and balance what they were used for, payment of invoice, transfer to this, this is the matter, this is the amount, this is the running total, all of these things. And then you come down at the end of the month and it's $9,210. That should reconcile with this report for that client. So everything should reconcile with each other. What we find is that people, law firms are having their bookkeepers reconcile their QuickBooks or Xero or, or whatever, their bank account with their financial software. So the software that they use for their CPA, but they're not looking at their time and billing software. Remember, that's what your clients see. That's what they expect to be in the account. If your firm had to be completely dissolved tomorrow, would you have the proper amount in your trust account to do that? You must reconcile the time and billing software to the bank. QuickBooks is great, and you should, but really, whatever you're telling the clients should be what you have in the bank on behalf of them. So that's a really important reconciliation that we often don't see happening. And that's where people get in trouble. And then we have to go in. We have to go back to when we can balance it. And then we go in and client by client, identify each entry for them. So you can see if you have a bunch of messy entries every month for a client because you're paying expenses and doing this and doing that, how hard that is to reconcile. How messy that's going to look if you have to get audited by the state bar account. Just It's just red flags all over the place. And it makes it much more difficult to manage. So this is what we're talking about. The bank, your time and billing software, and your financial software must, must reconcile to the penny. You can put money in your account, <clears throat> in your trust account for administrative purposes. 
So if you have an account and you don't have, have a lot of money in it all the time, and you're afraid that maybe a wire fee will randomly come out of your trust account and you might be overdrawn, put a hundred dollars in there and mark it as administrative, uh, administrative costs or something like that in your book so that you have a, a hundred dollars or a certain amount of money to cover kind of weird random things that might happen. Once your bank account is overdrawn, the state bar gets notified immediately. So that's one of the ways that you will be audited. The other way obviously is if a client complains and evidently in California, they have to complain a lot, right? So if you get complaints against you for, oh, I don't know, five or six years, <clears throat> something happens. Anyway, that's how you get audited. You get a complaint to the bar or your account is overdrawn. The place on your balance sheet that must be reconciled. So if you're reconciling with QuickBooks and your time and billing software and the bank, you're going to look at your assets and that's going to be your bank account for your trust, 57, 820, 25. And then you're going to go below the line, your liabilities. And you're going to say, this is my liabilities, retainers from client. That Those two numbers should match. So, oh, sorry. So if you're looking at, oh, I'm always doing this. This number and this number should match. So if you're looking at your balance sheet and those two numbers don't match, something's off. And they should match your bank account. Ah, I did it again. Match your bank account at the end of the month. So if you're getting this for November 30th, you look at your IELTA bank statement at the end of the month, that should be the balance. And that should be the balance in your time and billing software. Oh, I'm going very quickly. Does anybody have any questions so far? Okay. The most common mistakes, and again, this is not just in California. If you go to any state bar and you look um, on their websites for the, I don't know what it's called, for the disciplinary actions, you're going to probably in the top three, you're going to see trust account, mishandling client money, something like that in every state. It's happening all over the place. A lot of it's not because it's not intentional as we know, but borrowing money is one of the problems. Commingling money, again, not having a clear line of what goes in trust and what goes in your operating. Fees, so charging your clients fees or having fees come out of the trust account. So your fees should be, if you're paying fees for that trust account, should be taken out of the operating account. If you are charging your client fees for wire transfers and that's explicitly stated in your operating agreement or your engagement agreement, those fees can come out and as long as they're identified for that particular client. But fees traditionally are taken out of the operating account. So this is another reason for you to find a bank that knows what they're doing. <clears throat> you know, Wells Fargo Bank, client went in and said, we need to have the fees taken out of the operating. They say, we can't do that. Well, we all know that they can. It just didn't, that particular person didn't know that or, or whatever. So make sure, again, you're, you're working with people and banks that know what they're doing with these accounts and these fees. So the fees for these accounts should definitely come out of your operating account. Booking this, booking the trust account as income. Now, obviously we don't want to trust, you know, we don't want to book it as income because you're going to pay taxes on it. But if it's income anywhere on your financial records, it shouldn't be. It's a, it's an asset and a liability. It's not income, if that makes sense. And the bat, the, the last thing is bad record keeping not keeping the records, uh, not being clear, not having people know what's going on, what's happening, and not being able to provide the records easily and quickly for either the state bar or a client, having it take you know weeks and months to do that. One of the things that's changed in the last few years is, and you might be aware of this, is 
It used to be that you, if you took in trust money that was less than, it was a flat fee case and it was less than $1,000, you could put that in your operating account. That's changed now. You can put all of the flat fee receipts into your trust account immediately. However, you must describe that in the engagement agreement and allow the client to choose to put the money in the trust account. If in fact that client doesn't stay with you through the entire length of the case, you will be responsible for returning some of that money based on where you are in the process. So even though you have a flat fee case, there should be milestones that you can identify so that if in fact you're asked to stop preparing the trust documents because their brother-in-law just passed the bar, they want to give the work to him, then you should be able to say, okay, we've done this and this and this, and this is roughly 50% of the work, and we're going to give you 50% of the trust deposit back. And here's the, here's the information about where we are. So even though you're not tracking hours on flat fees, it's a good idea to be very clear about how you set your flat fees and what milestones there are. We recommend that periodically, maybe once a year, you track the hours on a few cases to make sure that not only are you being reimbursed for the work that you're doing, but you have a clear understanding of what you would have to reimburse if in fact that happened and just to be a, just to be understanding. Remember, your billable hour is your widget. We have to understand what the cost is for that widget. And even if we're doing a flat fee, 90% of us create the flat fee based on how many hours we think it's going to take. So our widget is our hours, our time. So we need to be very clear about what we're doing and how we're financing our time and if our time is being reimbursed appropriately. So if you're doing flat fees and you've been doing them for 20 years and you just, you know, you raise them 10% every year or whatever, when you get a new client, you think about the, think about the cost of living increases. Think about all the money that the, the, in, the salaries that have changed over the last five years in order to keep good people. Are you still profitable with your flat fees? If you haven't looked at those. Anyway, just an aside. Any questions? That's the end of my session. I just ran through this. Maybe you guys didn't have enough questions or I was talking fast because it normally takes me a lot longer than this. Does anybody have any questions or want to talk about something in particular? Yes. Uh, I I do have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. The state bar uh, now has said that in addition to other records that we traditionally kept, there is a requ requirement for keeping a journal, which is duplicative of some of the other things that we do. And my question is whether they they should be able to require us to go back and create a journal for past years prior to the implementation of this new system. You mean the, the trust ledgers, the ledger or journal for each client? Well, uh, I'm not sure exactly what they mean by the journal. I, I keep my records for each client in a sheet that shows what their funds are when they come in, when they go out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I have used for 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, in addition to that, as I understand, they've introduced this element that you need to keep a separate journal of the trustee. Or the it's not a new rule. And if you're keeping, uh, like if you're keeping, say, uh, a paper ledger card for each client or you have an excel spreadsheet for each client or one excel spreadsheet with different tabs for clients that's a ledger for your clients if you're if you're documenting every entry going in and every entry coming out and that reconciles with your bank that's the well, journey yeah the, yeah the terminology they use is that they want me to keep bank statements which i do cancel checks which i do mm -hmm. and the 
card or ledger for each client. Mm -hmm. but, they, but they also ask that you keep a journal. I, I don't know what that is. I don't I, I I don't know if that means the journal for the firm. So you have the 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 um this for the firm. Well <clears throat> I'm a sole practitioner, so it's not as complicated as it would be with the firm. Uh and uh and I uh, think you're fine. I think you're okay. fine. All yeah. right. If if the if they come up and if say you get audited tomorrow and the bar comes in, can you tell them how much money you have in the bank and how much money that you have on this ledger that you keep? Uh, I can tell them the, for each client. And you could add that up and say that this is how much I have and it would match your bank. It, that, that's right. Yeah, th that's that's what they want. Yeah. So, okay. you know. I don't know if I would go to the to the. Technically, you're supposed to have another spreadsheet or another document that that identifies all of those entries for a month for all of your clients. That's I guess that's what you're talking about as far as a journal. Uh, but you have them. They're just separated by client. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So. Uh, should you put them should you create one document that or one excel spreadsheet that has it all in there for each month yes that's what they're asking for is it ever going to become necessary and you can you put it together quickly if you need to well i don't know how quickly but it could be theoretically done but mm -hmm. my, my my concern was that i i don't think that i should be required to do that for prior years I wouldn't I wouldn't either. I'd I'd do it going forward. I'd yeah. start this year and go forward. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Now you might talk to an ethics attorney who tells you, oh my God, Diane's completely wrong. But in practicality, that's what I would do if I was helping you. Hey. Um you. I don't have a sample fee agreement, I don't think. However, the state bar does on their website. What do I think of Clio? Um, what do I think of Clio? Clio is the software that's been out the longest that has corrected the most problems and has the most opportunity for integrations. So it, it kind of, they give you these reports. As I, as I showed you, those reports are from, one of those reports is from Clio. <clears throat> Are you required to put flat fees in the client trust account, even if you know? Yes, unless you tell the client you aren't going to, in, in, unless you tell the client you aren't going to. Yeah, so just add it to your trust, just, just add it to your fee agreement. Um, so the, the handouts haven't been submitted, haven't been distributed yet? Is that no. it? Okay. No, they have not. They'll go out today or tomorrow. Okay, hang on, just uh, let me see if I can um, pull up. One of the things you're going to get is this document. Can you guys see this, the state bar? Yes. Okay, so this is kind of what the state bar is going to ask you on the website. So you know what you're going to have to answer. <clears throat> and it goes through, you know, I affirm that the funds held in IALTA are maintained in an IALTA eligible account. Um, I affirm that the registration information is updated annually with the state bar. Um, they're, you know, organized and, and held as, a, you know, in accordance with the rules of professional conduct. <clears throat> and then here you have, you've got the client ledger. The account journal, that's what you're talking about, I believe. Bank statement and canceled checks. One thing I need to say about bank statements is you're going to want to print those and save them electronically somewhere or, you know, paper somewhere because your bank may not have them available for you after a certain period of time. This kind of just hit me a couple of months ago was that, oh, 
we should be downloading and saving those in our document management or something so that we have our the complete records for the trust account in case we have to go back. Um, can you affirm that the monthly reconciliation is happening with the bank, the client ledger, and your account journal? Timely reports are provided to the clients. Um, normally, what we're doing is we're giving clients information on their bills that says how much money you have left in your trust and if there's any trust activity during that month for their account. And if you're not doing that, you probably should add that to your bill format. And then you talk about, it talks about the fee agreement, <clears throat> then how you're gonna handle the funds, that there's, they're held in trust, that fees are withdrawn at the earliest reasonable time once fees or a portion thereof become fixed and earned. As you can tell, they don't tell you anything. It's reasonable. <laughs> they are not used to pay bank charges or service fees. Um, I, I affirm that the disputed portion stays in the trust account. So these are these are basically everything that we went through today everything that you're supposed to do to manage your trust account hasn't changed. None of this is new. I've been giving this seminar for five years, but now you have to affirmatively attest to the fact that you know what the rules are and that your firm is following them. So hopefully that'll help. Anything else? Do we have to talk for another 12 minutes in order to get CLE? Uh, you know, I'm going to unspotlight and I'd like to open it up um, um, for everyone. I'd really encourage if there's any other questions, um, now would be a great time to do that. If anyone else has anything else to ask Diane. So one of the questions is clarify account journal and client ledger. So this is the firm trust account ledger. So this is the account ledger. Let's see, let me go back to my. And this is the client trust account ledger. Well, for them, it's the client ledger, take out account trust. It's just what I call it. So this is for the client and this is for the firm. Those are the two reports that you need to keep. So we're not, I'm not sharing my screen. Um, if that's it, Diane, you can stop sharing your screen if, if that's it. Uh, anything else from any other questions or comments? We have about 10 more minutes. Do you have any questions about anything operational for law firms? Yeah, I've got a question. Um, let's say we've got a balance that was uh, that we're struggling to get back to a client and it's in the trust account. Mm -hmm. Does this fall into achievement law uh, at that point or how do we go about getting that unclaimed property or that cash back to the client? I don't have the answer to that. Um, I will find the answer to that because I've been asked that before. I'm, I'm assuming that since it's in a in it, it's in a uh, an account that isn't even yours, that the the rules for California for abandoned accounts would kick in. Um, but I need to find that question out. I need. To, is there an ethics attorney on the on this call? Can anybody on that on the call answer that question? Anything else? I think there's one more in the chat. Okay. Yeah, there it is. I'd love to know how to return money when you can't find someone. I can't, I can't remember. I'd have to go back and read that, that thing. 
Yeah, I think you just from my understanding of a sheet man is you attempt to get it back to the last known address, you know, with a letter saying we have funds for you. If that letter goes unresponsive, then you send it to the state controller and they will attempt to get it to that uh, client or party. And then from there, if they don't respond to the state controller, the, the state can take in those funds. Um, but it, that's just my understanding of achievement from prior lives. I hadn't really ran into this with, you know, client trust funds, but I figured it would fall the same as, you know, a credit for an AP invoice, you know, in a similar scenario. Um, I was just curious if there was guidance. Um, I haven't seen that, but I, I will I will check with a couple of resources and, and find out if I can I can um, get that answer for you and then I'll send it back through the bar. Okay, thank you. What are the areas that your clients have gotten in trouble with the state bar outside of a client area client <laughs> trust account? I haven't had any clients get in trouble with with um, anything outside of the client trust account. Um, that's, you know, when you're talking about operations and what, what we do, which is all the operations, you're going to get in trouble with your employees or with the trust account primarily. It's not normally practicing. We don't get involved in, in the practice of law. And if you would maybe misrepresent or a paralegal would be representing as if they were a client, I mean, as if they were an attorney, those kinds of things. We don't normally get involved in that, but that's what I would see would be a problem. Question, please. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, I just want to know, um, does this satisfy the additional amount that the state bar wants, or is there more to it? Because this was really good. This is this is basically the requirements. Yes, this is, and this is, if you do what I've put in this presentation, you're going to be fine, and you can certify that you're doing it. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're very welcome. Good. And if anybody has a problem with their, you know, they're looking at their, their accounts and um, then, you know, speak to your bookkeeper, make sure that they can go back and reconcile a trust account. If you don't have somebody to do that, we can certainly help you with that. Um, it's not cheap. I'm really sorry to say, and um, it's always kind of a surprise. We had a gentleman, you know, uh, not even a gentleman, a client several years ago who had done that, had plant, who had uh, closed their account without reconciling it. And there was, it was like 200 and something dollars, but it's like, talk to your CPA and figure out how to account for that and make it zero. I'm glad it was clear. I'm glad, I'm glad. One of the prior questions uh, triggered uh, another question that I have not mm -hmm. with, uh, dealing with returning client files when you're ready to retire. Yep. Uh, I've found that uh, some of my clients have, have old files that don't want to destroy. And when I've tried to give them back, I haven't been able to contact the clients probably because they're deceased. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it occurs to me that maybe I could treat those as abandoned property and turn those files over to the state controller's office. How does that sound? Are they client files, like the records of your work for them? They're, they're, they're the, the client files, the, the files that I had for those clients. The state's and, not going to want them. You can destroy them if you can't find the person. Well, I know the state's not going to want them, but I, I'm reluctant to, to, to destroy them because I don't like destroying things. You'll, you'll, well, leave them for whoever takes over your practice, but you can destroy them. If you have a, if you have a policy, if they're a lot older than, what kind of law do you practice? General civil practice. Some of the, many of the files are estate planning files. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, they aren't the original state, the original estate plans are with your clients? Or did you keep the, those? The original wills and trusts are mostly with the clients yeah uh, years ago sometimes i kept them um, for safekeeping that was a big mistake i would never do that again mm -hmm. but uh, uh, those i keep in a fire resistant cabinet mm -hmm. but sure sure and, sure. I, and I think i'm sort of stuck with them but I, what happens when i'm no longer here on earth uh, with those files and i haven't been able to find clients i haven't been in contact with them for 20 years. 
If you've Hello. documented that you've attempted to find those clients and you're unable to find those clients, you can destroy those files, especially if they're older than seven years old. Yeah, it is push. okay. I don't think that there's anybody on this call that would disagree with that. And, and of course, it's always a good idea to have a statement to that effect in your engagement letter saying, well, I'm going to, I'll keep your file Absolutely. for X years, after which I'm going to get rid of it. As long as you keep that up and get rid of them. Right. A, lot of, a lot of people now are saying, I'm not keeping your files. I'm going to send them back to you at the end of this case. Uh -huh. Hey, Diane, it might be worth just spending a minute. You alluded to why this is happening now. You know, some people might be scratching their heads and saying, geez, this just came out of the blue. They didn't, the State Bar didn't really lay the pipe for it. Now, all of a sudden, it's this big announcement. Uh, you alluded to it. And the answer is Tom Girardi. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think we all got the letter from the State Bar Trustees in I think it's November 2nd or 3rd of last year, where they basically made this astounding confession about the number of complaints they'd had about Girardi, the most of which had to do with trust fund issues. Uh, so the State Bar kind of got kicked in the ass by that. Uh, they, you got, they had the, the state legislature looking over their shoulders at them. So they're like a cat on a hot stove. Uh, they got a new bar head bar disciplinary lawyer, a former federal prosecutor. Mm -hmm. So if, if I were a betting man, I would bet they're going to get hyper aggressive that whatever we saw in the past about, you know, how they conducted things, how they conducted audits, whether they conducted audits, et cetera. Uh, my own view is that at least for a time, they're going to get hyper aggressive. And my understanding also is that if they do audit you, they will come in and they won't do it themselves. They will come in and require you to go out and hire a CPA firm at your expense to conduct the audit and report to the state bar. Mm. Um, so, so just a word to the wise, just get your house in order. Uh, I think there's going to be some, some people are going to be hung out to dry. They're going to be looking for some scouts to hang out and show that the new cop on the beat is, is taking names and kicking ass. Uh, so I, I would just be very, very careful going forward. And my guess it's going to be small firms. Yeah, that's probably right, because the, the big firms are less likely to make mistakes um, and uh, because they have professional uh, managers, law mm -hmm. practice managers. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. I think it'll be small, solo and small firms and will be the low hanging fruit. And mm -hmm. some people are going to get crucified for innocent mistakes. Mm -hmm. and, and don't assume your bookkeeper knows about this. But my bookkeeper, your book, if your bookkeeper hasn't or your CPA hasn't a, a, a made you aware of this, it just means they don't know. They probably don't work with law firms much or they do, but they're doing it so long and they never learned it, whatever. But don't assume your bookkeeper knows about trust accounts. If you are looking for a new bookkeeper, make sure you find somebody that understands trust accounts and works with law firms, not your neighbor's son who just graduated from you know, Davis with his accounting degree. Really, it's it's really important. This is this is it for you guys, seen it for some of you. Okay. Okay. Uh thank you everyone. If there's no other questions, I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you. All right. Thank you everyone. You'll get your materials from Diane um and the uh, attendance certificate and an email from me in the next day or so. So keep an eye out for that. And uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank Goodbye. you for having me. I'll talk to you again. Yes. Bye. Bye.